Debbie Gibbs. Man, I get excited when I hear that theme music. You know why? Why is that? Because it means we're about ready to do an episode yeah. of True Crime all the time. Yeah, it's exciting, man. This is episode 24. 2-4. Two, wow. So I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me as always is my partner, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you tonight? Hey, I'm doing, doing well. I'm excited. Episode 24. All right, Gibbs, so are you ready to get into today's case? Man, I am. We're talking about the Wichita Massacre. So we did BTK before, right? So now we're going back to Wichita, Kansas. Yeah, so this case kind of bugged me when I was researching it. Did it? Yeah, even though it's not as long drawn out as some of the other cases we do, just what occurred at the house... And as we get into it, I, we'll talk about it, but it, it, it was disturbing to me. Well, and I think it happened within such a small period of time, right? So we're not talking about a serial killer. We're really probably talking more about a spree killer right? because of the amount of time. So this case is known, like we said, as the Wichita Massacre. It's also known as the Wichita Horror. You know, as we get into this one, Gibbs, I think... One thing that we're going to see and, and people are really going to take away from it is just the randomness of the violence. I mean, that's one thing that I got for sure. And I think that's one of the things that scares a lot of people. And I'll I'll put myself in there as well. You know, it's one thing if somebody's got a known beef with somebody and that person ends up dead, right? right. Horrible. Victim. All of that. But when you're talking about just normal people not put, putting themselves in harm's way by, you know, doing things illegal or doing things they shouldn't be doing, and they run into somebody that is just like a random killer. Absolutely. It's, it's disturbing. I mean, it's just really, you know, it's like somebody out on a joy ride and they knock on your door, you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, just. It could be this house. It could be three houses down. Yeah. There, there's no rhyme or reason. And for me, that adds like this certain different element to it. So what we're going to be talking about happened back in late 2000. And like we said, short period of time, we're talking about basically a week of terror. It was in Wichita, Kansas, two brothers, Reginald and Jonathan Carr, and they would go on a crime spree that included armed robbery, assault, rape, murder. I'm not sure. Was there something else that could have been in there? I mean, they did it all. They didn't waste any time. Home invasions, sexual assaults. We said that. Burglary, abductions, theft, carjacking. I mean, just in a week's time, the amount of fear that they put into the city. It was viciousness in that short amount of time. So like we always like to do Gibbs, we, we talk about the early life of these people. It's kind of one of the, the hallmarks of the show. Reginald Carr was born on November 14th, 1977 to Reginald Carr senior. So he's a junior and I'll, Try to make that clear as we go along. And Janice Harding, they were born in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, Reginald Sr. was only 17. Janice was only 16 when they had their first child, Reginald. Pretty young. Pretty young. Yeah. They would not marry until after Janice turned 18 because of what I would consider obvious objections from... Janice's mother, pretty soon after they had a daughter named Regina, was born 14 months later, and then came Jonathan, born on March 30th, 1980. Now, Regina was diagnosed with leukemia at two years old. Very sad, right? A two-year-old with, with leukemia. You know, she was on some medication, but she only lived another year. And died at the age of three. So Regina died at three. Reginald was only four, right? Just a year older. 
And by all accounts, he was absolutely devastated by the loss of his little sister. But the one thing that was noted was that he never shed a tear, didn't cry one bit. There was nobody in the family that could ever remember him crying over the loss of his sister, even though it was said he was devastated. That's strange. Yeah, it's very strange. And now again, he's four, but make of it what you will. Sure. I found it, you know, an interesting tidbit. But there again, you know, it's not going to be shocking to anyone listening that the brothers did not have a great childhood, right? We, we go through this all the time. Yeah, you know, if there's anything we've learned from covering these cases, Gibbs, it's, it's that a lot of these people that go on to commit horrible crimes, they had messed up childhoods. The, I mean, big time messed up. Yeah, big time messed up. Yeah. And you, you have to think there's a correlation here. It's got to be much more than coincidence. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a ton of people out there in the world today that had jacked up childhoods that don't go on to do this stuff. Cause there is, there's a lot of people that rise up from really horrible situations and go on to do great things, but that's not the people that we cover. We always get the ones that don't rise up and do wonderful things. Now, if we want, if you and I want to do another podcast called people that rise up and do great things, maybe we, we could do that. We cover, true crime and it's just amazing how much correlation there is with bad childhood yeah. somebody goes on to be a ruthless heartless killer yeah it just tells you to treat your kids good yeah <laughs> be there for them be there for them there were allegations that both brothers were sexually abused at a very young age and, and this is shocking to me because at about six years old, Reginald Carr Jr., I won't, I won't use the junior anymore because, or I won't use it after we're done talking about his dad. Let's put it that way. He begins having sexual interactions with little girls. We're talking six years old. And the way that I understand it is that their mom, Janice, was uh, babysitting other kids in the neighborhood. And it was these girls that she was babysitting that Reginald began to fondle or touch inappropriately by, at the age of six. Now, I don't even know where somebody gets the idea or gets it in their head at the age of six. That, I mean, that blows me away. Is that like kindergarten. Yeah, it's like first grade, kindergarten, first grade. Yeah. Wow. But by, but that's not even so. Okay. Let's blow that away. Right. By the age of seven, he is having what was termed frequent sex with one of his female cousins. I can't even grasp that. No, seven years old. Yeah, I don't don't even... This kid should have been playing with Tonka trucks, Lincoln Logs, Erector set. Well, he was playing with an Erector set, a different kind. But but you know what I'm saying? He should have been playing with toys. He's having sex with one of his female cousins. Now, the dad was physically abusive to the mother. You know, apparently they just fought and argued, they drank, they smoked pot. It was just a nonstop barrage in this household. And the crazy thing about it is that Janice, the mom, would say later that she thought that she had done a really good job of shielding the boys from all this abuse that was taking place. But she would later learn that they knew everything that was going on. They knew when she was being, uh, uh, you know, abused, both physically and verbally. So you just have to wonder, right? How much of this constant fighting, hitting, how much of this goes into 
their ultimate behavior as they become adults. Well, it's learning behavior. Has to be. Yeah. I mean, it's what they learned at home. So they, that's how they feel that's normal. Right. So if there's any listeners out there that have been watching Big Little Lies, which I thought was a really great show on HBO, I, I, I don't want to spoil the show, but there's a component in that show of this of, you know, kids being exposed to parents that have a very violent relationship, but there was just, just so much violence in, in the family, you know, it was said Gibbs that one type of punishment for the car children was that they would be made to strip naked for whippings. And this was by their mom would whip them naked while the so one would be stripped naked while the other one held them down while their mom whipped them. That's messed up. So you got one child participating in like a forced restraint, kind of teaching them torture. I, it, yeah, it's very it's very strange. You know, now I won't say that, and I don't know about you, but you know, I had a, a grandfather who was the kind to make you go get your own switch right off the tree. So not only are you going to get whipped with the switch, you got to pick it out yourself. Oh yeah. I used to have to go pick the racetrack and bring it back. Are you going to get, get a little whipping with the, with the racetrack part? You remember the little vinyl racetrack strips? Yeah. Well, we weren't millionaires like you, but yeah. all we had to play, <laughs> whatever was, we played with sticks and switches. I'm just, <laughs> Let me tell you, that little racetrack hurt like heck. I man. bet it did. Yeah, I bet it did. But I mean that that was a that was normal back then, right? I don't go tell my kids to, you know, break off a chunk of the tree, and yeah. and and even if I did, I, I sure as hell wouldn't strip them naked and have the other one hold them down while I beat them. I mean, again, I, I don't know what the thinking was there, but it doesn't matter. I guess in my mind, what all the thinking was, the key for me is, and obviously we're going to get into the crime, you know all of this played a part somehow. Sure, it developed them into what they became. So one day, the mom had enough. She had enough of the beating, she had enough of the violence. She took the kids and went to, moved out to her, mo her mother's house. And, you know, they would end up divorcing in September of 86. And it was said that after that point, the boys didn't really have much contact with their father at all. And actually, the father ended up remarrying pretty quickly and started a new family and moved out to California. But the part about that was, was that family members later said that Reginald, especially, and we're not talking a lot about Jonathan yet, but Reginald never got over this, what he considered abandonment by his father. Well, and it's, I mean, it's no secret, right? I mean, divorce surely messes up kids. It does, but don't call me Shirley. Yeah. <laughs> but no, you're right. It, a divorce does play havoc with kids. But divorce is so common these days. Yeah. Nowadays it's well, I don't way, even... you know, way too common. Yeah. But by all accounts, it was just, there was a lot of anger that built up. There was resentment over this fact that his, even though his mom left, it was over the fact that his father got remarried, moved away, was not there for them at all. Yeah. So it was bigger than just the divorce. It was the divorce where the other parent just left their life yes, completely. Exactly. I mean, I know a lot. I mean, my parents were divorced, but they stayed within a relatively close. They attended all the functions together. So, I mean, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Moving from Cleveland to California and basically saying, you know, hey, Adios. kids, see ya. Yeah. I'm starting a new family with my new wife. I, I guess that's the part where it didn't go over real good with, with Reggie Jr. Let's put it that way. Now, something happened to Jonathan that would kind of shape him as well. And this happened early on. I mean, I think around seven years old, there was a little girl at the elementary school where he went and 
she accused Jonathan and a couple of other students of raping her during a fire drill. Now, again, we're talking seven years old. But then again, he's learned and watched, I'm guessing, his brother at a young age doing that already to his cousin. So kind of common practice. This thing spread like wildfire, right? You can imagine a seven-year-old being saying that she was raped by several other seven-year-old students. The whole community knew what was going on. And basically, you know, Jonathan was branded as a rapist. But the crazy part of the story is, is that the girl later said it wasn't true. It turned out that she was actually molested by a relative and I'm assuming that she didn't, she was so scared to tell her family about the relative molesting her that maybe she had made up this story about some other boys that, and again, I I shouldn't make assumptions, but that's kind of what I'm, everybody hears the guilty part. They never hear when someone recants something, they still remember you're the rapist. They don't remember, Oh, she messed up. You're, you're cool. So this Jonathan tries to hang himself at seven years old. So again, I'm not trying to paint these guys as a sympathetic, as sympathetic figures, because what they're about, what they're about to do and what we're about to talk about, (laughs) you're, you're not painting these guys as anything but horrible animals, but you got to set, you got to tell the story. Right. And this is part of their story. Now they abused animals. Right. Another hallmark. We talk about it all the time. All the time. They they had BB guns. They would try to find defenseless animals to shoot them. When they couldn't find an animal, they shot at each other. So that was like their pastime. Me and my brothers did the same thing, uh, though. M- yeah, we did. Not too. the animals, but shooting each other. Right. We used to play that all the time. Yeah. It got to one point where Jonathan hit Reginald in the skull and the BB got stuck and they never took it out. So basically he walked around with a, with a head injury, with a BB stuck in his head. Now the family's moving around constantly in Cleveland. It was said that they, the boys attended eight different schools in eight straight years. Well, that's a problem. That is a problem. And look at all these things, right? One, maybe they can handle two, but you're, you're just piling, you know, and again, I'm not making excuses for these guys at all, but it just adds to it, you know, and any educator out there will say to have your child move from a school to school, you know, each year for eight years straight, you're asking for issues. Yeah. Because you're not staying at one place long enough to make a friend, to form any lasting relationships any attachments. So I mean, I, I, I just think that they're probably so detached at this point. And again, they're still very young. At one point, Janice picks up the family and they moved to Dodge city, Kansas. And it was because she thought that this was a better place to raise a family than Cleveland. So Gibbs, we talked a little bit about drug abuse or drug use. Another crazy aspect was that, The mother, which we said, you know, was, was drinking and doing drugs. She eventually starts getting some of her drugs from her son. And this is age 11. Wow. So he's dealing drugs. Mom. Age 11. Let me just. Age 11. Get this in my head. That is like saying a sixth grader. Fifth, probably. Fifth grader. Yeah. Fifth or sixth. So the fifth graders the local drug dealer for the mom. Yep. Wow. Okay. Just wanted to get that straight in my head. And his mom was, you know, one of his main buyers. I mean, how messed up is that? You're basically encouraging your child to sell drugs so that you can buy, I guess, so you don't have to leave the house to buy your drugs. That's what it sounds like. You know, the, we, we talked about the mom being a drinker by 16 Reggie's, you know, using alcohol heavily. He's fighting all the time. It was said that he actually beat up one of his teachers in ninth grade. 
he got suspended for sexually harassing a teacher in the eighth grade, sexually harassing a teacher in the eighth grade. Well, he's having sex when he was seven. So, so we said he starts selling drugs at 13 and at around that time, he also joins a gang. This guy's done more by the age of 13 Gibbs than you and I have done our whole life. Speak for yourself. Well, bad. Yeah. Well, maybe speak for you. I don't know. I can't speak for you. Me and my K-Bar. You're wanted in several states. Me and my K-Bar. But all jokes aside, right? 13 years old, just a little bit that we've talked about. This kid's done a lot of crazy stuff. Yeah, he's, he's not headed down the right path. And his brother idolizes him. Jonathan idolizes Reginald. So... He's just seeing all of these things and he's also doing some of these things. So in 1995, things start to catch up with, with old Reggie and he's sentenced to 13 months in prison for theft. And it was said that basically what he was convicted for, and I shouldn't laugh because it, it is a crime, but he robbed the bookstore at the local community college in Dodge city wearing a Michael Myers Halloween mask. Sweet. I have one of those. I, that does not surprise me at all. Yeah. You probably also have the Jason Friday, the 13th hockey mask. Yeah. How'd you know? (laughs) It goes with a K bar. So like we said, sentenced to 13 months, he was also ordered to serve six months for both aggravated assault and subverting the legal process. So he did his time, but then in 96, he picked up a 28 month drug charge paroled in 2000. Same year he gets booked for drunk driving. He's a busy guy. Yeah. I mean, he's just going down a very, very bad path. He spent a lot of time in this period in jail and somehow managed to have two kids you know, I, I, I didn't detail it out, but he had two kids with two different women. One of them, I think, was born while he was in jail. So it was kind of all happening in the short periods of time when he was out. So like we said, he gets in trouble in 2000 after he'd just been paroled. But something really strange happens. They called it a new law that was basically meant to cut parole for nonviolent offenders. But it was also some kind of data entry error. And it was the combination of these two things that let him out. So it was an error. He should not have gotten out even with this new law. It was the two things coupled together. It's a huge mistake, man. Well, and we're going to find out it was a costly costly mistake because he gets out on December 1st, 2000 and on December 4th, 2000, this is when Reginald and Jonathan back together again, they take a trip to Wichita. All right, Gibby. So let's get into the crimes. We just got through saying that Reginald and Jonathan get into Wichita on December 4th. So we're late on the night of December 7th, 2000. And a 23 year old man named Andrew Schreiber is stopped at a convenience store in Wichita. Reginald and Jonathan force themselves into the car. They've got a gun and they make Schreiber drive to a bunch of different ATMs to get out money. Now, he would later say that basically he was just hoping that if he did what they said, they'd let him live. The two brothers split up. One follows in another car. One's driving in Schreiber's car. They make him drive out to this field way out, outskirts of town. They pistol whip him, beat him up pretty bad, throw him out of the car, And they shoot all his tires out and then they take off in the car, the other car that they had brought with them. So this is their first crime in the 
to start off the this week long reign of terror. But they don't kill him. They scare the shit out of him. Got lucky. You know, I'm sure the guy was scared to death, but they don't kill him. They're basically just out to get his money. So four days later, on December 11th, the cars tried to hijack 55-year-old Linda Walenta's SUV while she sat in it in the driveway of her suburban East Wichita home. Yeah, so I think what they were doing, Gibbs, is they were just stalking, right? They're looking for somebody that they can hijack that's going to have their wallet. Everybody's got their debit card on them. Right. They're going to make them drive or drive them to an ATM, probably make them drive to try to stay out of the, uh, what do you call those? The little cameras. Yeah. Yeah. The little, the little cameras. On make them, them take out the three, four, five, whatever the, their limit is. And that's why I think they went to several ATMs. So then one of the brothers, you know, he approaches Mrs. Walenta and apparently asking her for some type of help. She was, of course, a little suspicious. As she should be. Yeah, because she thought, you know, here's this car that's been following me, right? Now I'm sitting here and they're they're walking up to me. She did roll down her window just a little bit to hear what he was saying. And that's when he stuck you know, the gun in sideways, you know, the kill shot sideways. The, the gangster move? Yeah, the gangster move. So, you know, he, he slides the gun and to the opening and shot her several times as she tried to drive away. I guess my question is, would he have shot her had she not tried to drive away? Because he didn't kill, or he, I should say they, they didn't kill Andrew Shriver because he basically complied with them. Yeah, so I guess maybe they were, when you don't do what they ask, then they get upset and that's what caused it i mean well when was... she when she drives away they're gonna have a hard time getting in her car to make her go to the atm yeah so he's like well, why okay not, why not go on to somebody else another well, suv i think that's a good question but so i think they made their target and they were going to take that vehicle no matter what I, I think you're right she survived but only for about three weeks she ended up dying from her gunshot wounds about three weeks later but what she was able to do was to provide information about her shooters. So in that sense, she did a lot of good in, in those, in that time. Yeah. Period. Because that will come into play later. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. So we know basically around December 14th. So three days later after they hijacked the, the, the car, right. Or attempt to hijack the car and shoot Mrs. Walenta. Right. So three days later, you know, their reign of terror continues. Three days later, but only seven days from the beginning, right? Seven, And we said it's seven days long. That's all it is. Yeah. But and the, we're but, on day seven already. Yeah, but this day seven's... It's the whole ball of wax. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the big... It's, I mean, I can't even describe the cruelty that's going to occur. Right. It is. It's shocking. It's basically a massacre, right? This is why they call it the Wichita Massacre. So at this point, Linda Walenta is fighting for her life. She doesn't die until January 2nd, right? We're on December 14th. There's only going to be one survivor of this massacre. And it's a woman whose name is Holly G. They don't give out her last name to protect her identity. And even if we found it, we wouldn't want to say it anyway. Yeah. I think she's been through enough. I think she, she goes through a whole hell of a lot, but you know, so Holly is a 25 year old school teacher. And basically the fact that she survives, she is able to tell the story. So all of the facts that we're getting ready to talk about, are really mostly known because she survived. I mean, they I'm sure they could have pieced a lot of it together, but not to the details that we're going to no. be talking about. I mean, th these are her statements. Right. Yeah. So these are not Mike and Gibby thinking what happened. This is the lone survivor saying on the night of December 14th, this is what happened. 
Now that night, it was a Thursday. Holly was going to spend that night with her boyfriend, whose name was Jason Beffert. He was 26 years old. Uh, He was a teacher as well and also a coach at at a local high school. He lived in a condo with two of his college buddies, one named Bradley Haka, who was 27, and Aaron Sander, who was 29. And Aaron had recently decided that he was going to go into the priesthood. So Holly arrives at the condo around 8.30, and she's got her pet schnauzer with her, whose name is Nikki. Her boyfriend Jason's not there, but the two roommates are. Not long after Holly gets there, another woman gets there by the name of Heather Muller, and she's a 25-year-old graduate student at Wichita State. Now, she also worked as a church preschool teacher. So I, I just want to talk about this real quick, Gibbs. You've got two teachers. You've got a church preschool teacher. And you've got a guy that is about ready to go into the priesthood. And the other guy was a, a financial analyst. So I'm going to say this is a pretty nice group of people. Yeah. And that's what I think I was hinting at in the beginning. These are not people that are cooking meth in a mobile home in the desert, right? They're not breaking bad. No, they're not. They're just trying to meet up and, you know, spend some time together. They don't on, even know who Walter is. They don't even know who Walter is. They're mm-hmm. they're just trying to spend some t- time together on a Thursday night. I mean, to that point, Holly is grading papers and watching television. I mean, that's the extent of her activity at that time. And then finally, her boyfriend, Jason, comes home about 9.15. And at around 10, they go to bed, right? So exciting night. Grade some papers, watch some TV, in bed by 10. The rest of the people in the house are sleeping in, you know, somebody's sleeping on the couch. The other woman's in a second bedroom and... Hake is in like a room in the basement. So right around 11 o'clock, the porch light comes on. And this surprises Jason because before he went to bed, he'd made sure all the doors are locked, all the lights are out. Probably, you know, part of his, or a lot of our routines, you know, before you go to bed. Yep. Typical night routine. And he was still awake. He hadn't kind of, hadn't fallen asleep yet. All of a sudden, they start hearing voices. And then very quickly, somebody forces open the door to the bedroom. And Holly would describe this later in detail, that what she saw was a tall black male standing in the doorway. They had no idea how they got into the house, because by all accounts, like I said, Jason had made sure all the doors were locked. And the police really never come out to say how the cars got into the, to the property. But Holly goes on to say that she would later identify this man as Jonathan. He rips the covers off their bed. Immediately after that, another black male who was going to be Reginald brings in Aaron Sander. And remember, Aaron is the one that we said was going to go into the priesthood. He brings Aaron in from the living room at gunpoint, throws him on the bed. Both men are armed. They both have guns. Holly goes on to say that the two men are asking them both, her and Jason, who else is in the house. And they tell them about Haka, who's in the basement, and Muller, who's in that ground floor bedroom. Ultimately, Reggie and, and Jonathan go get and round up everybody, and they get them into... Holly and Jason's bedroom. Yeah, but then they're they're told to take all their clothes off. Yeah, Gibbs, and this is where everything starts to get really sick and really twisted. Because, you know, I'm sure that Holly and Jason and, and everybody involved is saying, you know, here's our money. Take whatever you want. Don't, you know, just don't hurt us. Yeah, but then they then they make them all get into one of the bedroom closets. 
They do. They make them all get into a closet and then they start bringing them out in pairs. And they're pairing them up basically for sex. Mm-hmm. Now, the first pair to come out are Holly and Heather Muller. And again, some of this is hard to talk about, but this is what our show is about. It's about the details and to leave out the details would be to skip out on the story. Holly and Heather are made to have oral sex. They're made to penetrate each other with, you know, fingers and, and different things. And then they bring out Mr. Haka. They make him have sex with Holly. They make Jason Beffert have sex with Holly. But then they find out that he's her boyfriend. And because of that, they make him stop. So, you know, how weird and twisted is that? Yeah, that's that's definitely weird and very twisted. For some reason, they didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that he was her boyfriend. That wasn't exciting for them, or I don't know what words you want to use. Right. So they switch it up, and they make Mr. Sander have intercourse with Holly, Now, again, this guy's getting ready to go into the priesthood and he refuses. He absolutely will not do this. And they pistol whip him repeatedly. They send Holly back to the closet and bring back out Heather Muller. Now, it turns out that Heather Muller was Aaron Sanders' old girlfriend. Holly is would later testify right now. Obviously that's how we know all of this. Cause she testifies, tells the police everything. And when Mr. Sander is ordered to have sex with Heather, he's unable to get an erection. And because of that, the brothers beat him with a golf club. So he's already been pistol whipped and now they're beating him with the golf club. Well, to make it even even tougher, I mean, now they go into this thing where they tell them, you've got 11 to 11.54 to get hard. And then they start the countdown. So, I'm trying to think of what to say, Gibbs, because if you've got a problem with that, in that situation, having somebody stand there and count down... It's not going to help it. ...is not going to help you achieve that goal. I can tell you that right. Well, I can't tell you that from experience. I I can just tell you, I can imagine the pressure that that guy was under, right? They're all fearing for their life and they're counting down and telling him he has to get an erection in like two minutes or whatever it was. Now, for whatever reason, we know it never happened. And and Holly she says that you know he was returned back to the closet with no 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 beating nothing happened to him so i mean he he was able to walk away from that was put back in the closet and at that time they went ahead and and got jason out of the closet yeah so they want jason now to have sex with heather and also for Bradley Haka to have sex with Heather. So, I mean, they're just arranging pairs and, and trios and just putting people in different situations for their own amusement and pleasure. What possible pleasure they could have got out of this, I, I can't even I can't fathom. Either, yeah. I mean, to the point that even Holly said that she could hear Heather, you know, moaning in pain. It was that that terrible. Right, because I don't think we talked about this. The closet was not very far away from where all this was taking place. So everybody that was in the closet could hear everything that was going on in the area where all of this other extracurricular stuff was taking place. Because they start act, asking people about their ATM cards. And this is where Reginald Carr starts taking each of the victims one at a time to the ATM machine in Jason Beffert's truck. And he starts with Bradley Haka. Now, while Reginald and Bradley are out 
at the ATM, Jonathan starts doing stuff on his own. He takes Holly out of the closet. He rapes her. And then he sends her back to the closet. Reggie and Bradley get back from the ATM. And then Reggie takes Jason Beffert with him to do the same thing. Now, while Reggie is away with Jason Beffert, Jonathan takes Heather out of the closet and rapes her. So the next one to go is Holly. But for whatever reason, Reggie lets her put on a sweater, but nothing else. No pants, no underwear, no nothing. Just a sweater. And as they're driving, she's asking him if he's going to kill them. And he says no. And she even goes to the point, you know, do you promise? Do you promise you're not going to kill us? And he says, yes, I promise. So they get the money from the cash machine. And on the way back, this is where, I mean, I just can't, I can't even process some of this stuff, Gibbs. Because Reggie says to to Holly, as they're driving back to the condo, he says, you know, you're really cute. I wish we could have met under different circumstances because I think we would have hit it off. (laughs) Can, Can you imagine? No, it's just weird, you know. I mean, even on their way to the ATM, you know, he's telling her about, you say, you know, she was allowed to put on a sweater, but nothing else because he would like to see, he told her, I like to see you, you know, with no panties on. I mean, say that, do everything that you've done to her. And now you're going to say, you know what, if we met under different circumstances, I think we'd be really good friends. Maybe go out and maybe have a relationship, you know? I mean, is, is that, is that something going on in the brain that's where, psycho, man. where wires are not connecting yeah, it's something all to right. think that th- that that makes sense to say that after people are being raped and pistol whipped and yeah forced to have sex with people they don't want to have sex with i it, it's shocking it really is yeah. but it's nothing compared to what's going to happen no what's coming up next is <laughs> just yeah it gets keeps getting worse because He's saying these things to her on the ride back. As soon as he gets home, he rapes her. Jonathan rapes Heather Muller again. And then he rapes Holly again. So after all this, they start ransacking the house. They're looking for all kinds of money. One thing they find is an engagement ring. And this engagement ring is something that Jason Beffert had bought for Holly. And when they find it, he has to tell her, that's for you. I was going to ask you to marry me. And that's how she learned that Jason was going to propose to her. And he had planned on doing it like the upcoming Friday or, you know, in a week or two on a Friday. Close to Christmas. Eve. Yeah. Right before Christmas. So while they're still in the condo, Holly says later on that Reginald says something that, that really, really scared her as though all the stuff that happened before hasn't scared her enough, but he says, relax, I'm not going to kill you yet. So in the car, in the truck ride, he's promised not to kill her. Yeah. Cause we could be really good friends and probably go out someday if we met under different circumstances. Sure. So. I won't kill you or rape you as soon as we walk back in the door. But I do, and I will. Right. But now he's saying, I'm not going to kill you yet. So Gibbs, up until now, everything has taken place inside the condo with the exception of them leaving to go to the ATM machine one by one. But now Reginald and Jonathan, they're gathered everybody up and they've made them go outside so remember now, this is Wichita, mid-December. It's freezing out. There's snow on the ground. I think, I don't know, it was something like 17, 18 degrees outside. Yeah, it was very, very cold that night. As the gentlemen that they are, Reginald and Jonathan let the women put on sweaters. Oh, But that's it, right? But naked, that's it. Naked from the waist down and no shoes. That's the real sweet people. Yeah, they're sweetheart gentlemen. Mm-hmm. 
the men they made go out completely naked. And at first they tried to force all of the victims into the trunk of Aaron's Honda Accord. Now, any intelligent person probably would have known from the get go, you're not getting that many people into the trunk of a Honda Accord. Right. But they quickly realize that, that they can't fit everybody in there. So what they do is they put the men in the trunk. Reginald takes Holly with him in Jason Beffert's truck. And Jonathan drives the Accord with Heather Muller inside the car. And as they drive away from the house, you know, Holly glances at the clock in the car and she realizes it's, it's a little after two, it's like two Oh seven. So this is like three hours after the, the initial ordeal began three hours of yeah. torture. That's a long three hours for yeah, what they, especially went for through. the women. Cause they're the ones that at, up to this point have received the greatest amount of torture. Yes. I would say that. And also, Aaron in a different way, in a different way. His was more beating. Yes. But it probably doesn't compare to what the women went through, but they don't drive very far and they stop the truck and the car in an empty field. Reginald makes Holly get out of the truck and go sit with Heather in the Honda Accord. So Holly would later state that, they lined the three men up in front of the Honda. So Jason, Bradley, and Aaron. She turns to Heather and she says, they're going to kill us all. The Carr brothers tell Heather and Holly to get out of the car. Heather standing next to Aaron, who, like we said, was her former boyfriend. And Holly stands by her current boyfriend, Jason. All five of them are ordered to turn away and kneel in the snow. And again, Hollywood State, as she was kneeling, she wasn't even to the ground. Gunshots go off. Then Holly would say that she she heard Aaron because she knew Aaron's voice. And she could hear Aaron say, please, no, sir, please. But then she heard the gun, the gunshot go off. So Holly was ultimately hit with a, with a gunshot, but before she was hit, she had already heard three shots be fired. She felt a bullet hit the back of her head and she described it as feeling like everything was gray with little white stars. The crazy thing to me, Gibbs, is she says she didn't fall down. Right, so she's kneeling. Yeah, probably just weeba wobbling back and forth a little bit, you know? Gets hit in the head with a gunshot. Right. Doesn't completely go down face first. She's still kind of upright. She wasn't unconscious. And it wasn't until one of the brothers came over and kicked her that she fell forward into the snow. But then she's smart. Right? She, is, she was very smart because at this point, she starts to play dead. Try and her best not to move a muscle because she knows if they think for a minute that she's not dead. Yeah. They're going to shoot her. Exactly. Yeah. They're going to finish her off. So now Holly's laying in the snow and she can hear the car brothers drive off and Jason Beffert's pickup truck. And it, as they drive off, they're actually running over the victims as they, as they left them there laying in the snow. That, that is so You've already shot them, and then you're going to run over their bodies. Yeah, to the point even Holly feels part of the truck touch her yeah. as they pull pull away. So again, like we said, and I'm going to talk about it a couple times, I can't say enough about the grit. I don't know what you call it, Gibbs. The willpower, the grit, the whatever term you want to use, she had it. She did. She was a fighter. What an amazing... That's not even a good enough word, really. What a caliber of a person to go through what she went through. And then, you know, she has to sit here and talk about it. 
Oh, she has to relive the whole thing. Yeah, in multiple times, right? Not only statements to the police, but ultimately the trial, yeah. right? So she waits until she can't hear the cars anymore. And she finally turns her head as she can still see the lights of the truck and the car kind of going away. And she looks at her friends and her boyfriend, Jason, everyone's face down. She's rolling them over. Blood is coming out of each of these individuals. Yeah. I mean, she even takes her sweater off and tries to stop the bleeding of Jason's wound on his head. But, but she, I mean, she says that he had blood coming out of his eyes. Yeah. That's how bad it was. Right. So she did everything she could, but she probably in her heart knew that there was nothing that she could do because he'd been hit in the head as well, but obviously much more severely than she had been. But then something happens and she sees in the distance some Christmas lights of a house. So you've got to, you got to think about this picture. This is a woman who's now completely naked because she's taken off her sweater to try to save her boyfriend's life, which she probably had no chance to do. She's barefoot. She's got a bullet wound in her head and she is trying to walk to these Christmas lights in the snow. Now it was said that this house was more than a mile away from her. I don't, I don't want to walk a mile naked in the snow on a good day. And that's why I get back to, you know, and was it, was it adrenaline? Was she just that much of a fighter? Well, she had, I mean, 17 degrees out too. I mean, it's like you said, it's freezing snows on the ground. She's got to go through a construction site. She's got to walk around a, a pond during winter time to make sure she doesn't fall in. I mean, she, She's doing all this amazing stuff to get to these far off Christmas lights. And she finally gets there. And when she does, she's pounding on the door, ringing the doorbell. There's a young married couple that lives there and they answer the door. And obviously she's screaming, help, help. And at one point she says, we've all been shot. Three of my friends are dead. Well, and it's time she's, at this time, she still thinks Jason's alive too, right? Right, because she thinks she she had tied the sweater around and maybe stopped the... Stopped the bleeding. Used it as a tourniquet. And again, she wants to think her boyfriend's alive. I, I, I understand. I get that. So the couple, they get some blankets, they wrap her up. And this is the part that... I almost got chills about this part, Gibbs. Because the couple... Right after they think about getting these blankets to get her warm, their next thought is, we've got to call 911. Yeah, it's natural. And Holly says, don't call. And the reason why she says that is because she was afraid she was going to die. And she didn't want any time to go by without her being able to tell these two people exactly what had happened Describe her attackers, what they did. I mean, imagine that. You're saying, don't call 911 so that the ambulance can get here and save my life. I've got to tell you this just in case I don't make it. So you can, so the people can be caught. Yes. Mm-hmm. Again, chill. I, I'm getting chills right now just oh, yeah. thinking about it. Well, it's just amazing. So she tells the couple this whole story. Only after she's sure that they know everything does she let them call 911. Now, she still thinks she's going to die. And because of that, the next thing she wants them to do is call her mother and her boyfriend's parents and to tell them all that she loves them. Man, Mike, and she was also worried about the children at the school that she taught. And she kept on wondering who, who's going to take care of the kids in the school. I mean, she's thinking, who's going to take care of the kids in the school? As she's afraid she's dying. Yeah. She is worried about her kids. Yeah. What I mean. Yeah, I got my eyes are tearing up a little bit. Hold on. Because you just think about that, man. You're like. Oh, yeah. It, it just gets to you. Yeah. It yeah. really does. She, I mean, there's 
at no point was it ever about her. No. You know, not after one. everything she went through, she's never thinking, she, you know, she's thinking about getting him help. She's thinking about the kids at the school. She's thinking about getting the story out there so that her friends, their deaths won't go unanswered. Right. I mean, she's, it's her she's, mom, her mom, her boyfriend's know? parents. Yeah. I mean, she's thinking about all that after everything she's been through. Uh, I, you know, I know she probably won't listen to this, you know, because she's lived it. Oh yeah. She would never no, listen. No, but this. if she, man, what an amazing, amazing person to, to that's, yeah, <laughs> gonna get choked up. Man. I know. <laughs> I was gonna give you a hard time for not finishing that uh, sentence, no. but it's hard because it even when you research this stuff, and we we've gone over it ahead of time, when you're reading it and talking about it, it chokes you up. Absolutely. So the paramedics come, and one of you know obviously they're taking care of her. But the other thing they get is a description of Jason's truck and pretty quickly they're able to figure out the license plate number. Obviously that's, they can look that stuff up easily and they get out an alert by six, seven o'clock in the morning. So very quickly they've got radio television stations. Everybody is broadcasting. So basically all points bulletin, right? Yeah. Basically an APB, but Oh, but using, radio and television be on the lookout for this truck with this plate number. Now something, another thing crazy, right? There's a lot of crazy stuff here and maybe I'm using the word crazy too much. I got to come up with a different word. This is more miraculous because as the medical personnel are tending to Holly, it's pretty quickly that they determine that this metal barrette that she's wearing in her hair had deflected the bullet slightly. And it's the, it's what saved her life. Yeah. Wow. Without this metal barrette, the bullet would have went in, you know, would not have changed course and would have killed her. That's miraculous. That is. Now what Holly couldn't have known at this time was that after the car brothers, had taken everybody out and had shot them. They had driven back to the condo and they'd loaded Jason's truck with anything that they could find that had any value. So, you know, you and I don't do a lot of disclaimers because most of the stuff that we talk about is horrible. But one thing that I've been hearing lately, because I do, I do pay attention to what people say is that, you know, we should maybe say when a child or a, an animal is involved. So we're getting ready to talk about an animal. So I'm saying that right now because it's at this point that the cars commit their final kill because ultimately the police find Holly's pet schnauzer, Nikki in a pool of blood dead from a gunshot wound. Now, why in the hell would these guys need to kill that dog? Yeah. That dog was not going to stop them from taking whatever they wanted in the house. Not that we need to confirm how sick they are at this point, because it just tells you how mentally unstable or messed up, jacked up these guys were. Yeah. They've already killed some people. Right. Right. And then they, they feel like they need to kill a dog. Yeah. The dog can't identify them. The dog can't do anything to them. No, I, it's a little schnauzer, man. <laughs> now people are going to say, why are you worried about the dog? Cause they killed people. Well, yeah. it's more of the, I guess for me, the reason why. Yeah. The reason why they killed the people. Cause they could identify. Them. Yes. That's, that's, right. I think you and I are on the same page there. The dog's not going to call 911 and yeah. say there's no dog whisper out there it's going to go no yeah it was all pointless but this was really just pointless <laughs> you're right this whole thing is pointless and that's just another pointless part of the story yeah I mean, right it none of this had to happen no none of it had to happen all right so gibbs by 7:30 the police already have a report of the missing truck 
and it said that it's outside a, a apartment building in downtown Wichita. Neighbors had seen two men that matched Reginald and Jonathan's description hauling a big screen TV up the stairs. Now, ultimately, this is a TV that they had taken from Jason Beffert's home. The police move in very quickly, seal off the area. Now, you got to think, this is 7.30. The killings happened at 2, 2.30. So this is quick, like we said. And there's two officers that knock on the door of the apartment that people had reported that Reginald and Jonathan went in. A white female answers the door. Her name is Stephanie Donnelly. Turns out that she was Reginald Carr's girlfriend. They shared the apartment together. Police catch Reginald as he's trying to, you know, get out of a window. Good for them, man. I mean, this is it's just amazing. You know, we talk about cases that it takes 20, 30 years to solve. Yeah. But go back to Holly. Because without Holly... Oh, none of this would have happened. None of this happens. And it sure as hell doesn't happen in what is essentially five hours. Amazing to me that everything can, transpires as quickly as it does. So Stephanie Donnelly tells the police that Jonathan is driving a Plymouth Fury. And again, it's about 12 p.m., So we're only fast forwarding like four hours in the very same day. Yeah. I mean, it's already just noon. Yeah. Noon. They find the car. They find Jonathan Carr, who's with his girlfriend that he's basically had for a couple days. I think he just met this woman. Now he takes off as soon as he sees the police, but they're able to catch him. So this is just, this is amazing, man. Time wise, it really is. So you're saying less than twelve hours, they got they got the guys, they got them. This is amazing, but like you said, it's all because of Holly. Yeah, but how many murders are identified and the perpetrators are caught within twelve hours of the act? Yeah. So they arrest Reginald and Jonathan. Now, Jonathan had Jason Beffert's diamond ring that he had bought and had intended to give Holly when he proposed, had that in his pocket. And again, we got to go back to Andrew Schreiber. He was the first victim of the cards jacking and the ATM thing who was not killed. He was easily able to recognize these two guys as the men who'd kidnapped him just a week earlier. And as soon as he sees them on TV, he contacts the police and and tells them, Hey, those are the guys. So Gibbs, I think we have to jump to the trial because, you know, everything got wrapped up so quickly. I mean, they were, it's not like they were hunting these people for months and months. There's, there's just not much to talk about there. They caught them so darn fast. But Reginald and Jonathan, they're facing over 50 counts each. Great. Going all the way from first degree murder, rape, robbery. They even threw in animal cruelty for the dog. Good. Which they should. So part of the evidence that the prosecution was able to put forth was that they were the police were able to confirm the link between the Carr brothers to and all the crimes because a highway worker found a black 380 caliber handgun along route 96. And this is a highway that is near the field where the massacre took place. And once the state crime lab ran all their tests, they were able to confirm that it was the weapon used to kill all the people in the field but also Ann Walenta. And it was also the gun used to shoot out the tires of Andrew Schreiber's car. So that, you know, again, we're talking about mounting evidence. Yeah, I mean, it all ties it all together. Yeah, you don't get, 
much better than that to tie this gun that they were able to link to them, but also linked to all the crimes. So they kind of brought it full circle. And it's very early on that the prosecutors come out and say that they're seeking the death penalty. Good for them. We talk a lot about it and I really don't care whether you're for the death penalty or you're against the death penalty. All I'll say is if there ever was a case for the death penalty, this has to be one of them. Yes. This was a heinous, vicious crime, pure and simple. So the defense for the Carr brothers, they want two separate trials because ultimately what they want to do is to be able to pit each brother against the other. So Jonathan's attorney wants to be able to say that it was all Reginald, right? Creating reasonable doubt for Jonathan and Reginald's attorney wants to be able to do the same thing, basically laying all the blame on Jonathan, allowing a jury to find some kind of reasonable doubt for Reginald. Yeah. I mean, I get their, their plan, you know, well, it's a good plan. It is. I mean, it's, it's a tactic. I mean, what else do they have? I mean, they're the evidence that is against them is pretty solid. They're not trying to say we didn't do this. They're trying to say it was the other brother. Yeah, I was just along for the ride. Right. I, I was there, but I didn't do it. I didn't pull the trigger. That's ba- What else can they do? Now, the prosecutor comes back and says, no, we want to try both of them together we don't want you pulling that stuff. They, you know, prosecutor knows that that's what they want to do too. One of the prosecutor's arguments is that a lot of people that commit crimes together or tried together. And the other one is, is that their thought is the trial is probably going to last around a month. It's going to have 70 witnesses and that for the sake of money, two trials would just be too expensive. Mm -hmm. It would be double, doubly expensive, right? So Gibbs, I think we talked next about some of the prosecution evidence that they presented in the trial. I mean, yeah, they, a lot of gruesome stuff. This was a gruesome case. There's no doubt about it. And the evidence that was shown to the jurors had to be gruesome to convey the magnitude of the crimes. Yeah. I mean, you have to I don't want to say, but you do. You have to sell it, right? You're selling it to the jury. Well, and I, I, I think this was an easy one. Oh. And I don't know if that's the right word, sell, but no, I know what you're you know saying. What I mean. Yeah, I mean, I the think, way you want to convey it. Yeah, I think this was an easy one because the evidence spoke for itself. Yeah. So they had, you know, obviously color photographs of that were taken of all the victims at autopsy. They were able to show the beatings the rapes, the gunshot wounds that killed, you know, the five people. And I'm including Ann Walenta, right, as as one of the five. But it was said that some of it was so rough that one of the jurors fainted during the trial. Prosecutors came out and said that, well, kind of like what you and I were saying, the evidence was necessary to prove the elements of the crime, primarily premeditation and the intention to kill, right? Because that's the key in this situation. It wasn't like something happened and all of a sudden somebody got killed. At a certain point, Reginald and Jonathan knew and planned to kill these people. There's no doubt about that. So obviously they knew from very early on that the four individuals in the field had died of gunshot wounds. But as they started to do more forensic testing and, you know, at autopsy and all that, they could tell that the shooter was so close to Heather Muller and Aaron Sander that the pistol was touching their heads as the bullet was fired. And then for Bradley Haka and Jason Beffert, 
they were able to determine that they were shot just a little bit slightly farther away. But I think the key here, Gibbs, is that they have Holly, right? They have Holly's story and they have the forensics that are matching up with exactly what she's saying, right? They can tell that certain people were beaten. They can tell that obviously both of them were raped. And I assume that they would have done a rape kit on, on Holly, probably at the hospital. They could have told that from Heather's autopsy. Sure. So everything is lining up, but the key is Holly. Holly survived it. She was there. They were even able to say that the bruises on the men had these ridges that suggested that those injuries came from a golf club. And that golf club was ultimately found back in the condo. So they were able to tie that in. So I guess what I'm saying is they had a ton of evidence. Evidence wasn't a problem. No. So obviously, you know, like we talked about earlier on and before she died during that period was able to, to give descriptions of her attackers And I'm sure they use that, you know, at the trial as well. But when it comes down to it, this was basically an open shut case. When you looked at the evidence, it was overwhelming. Really, eyewitness testimony alone, without all the forensics, probably would have put, put them away, convicted them. But they had the forensics to go with it. There was really no doubt in the mind of the jury, I don't think Gibbs, uh, that the, that the car brothers had committed the crimes. So the, the real thing is, in my opinion, they're the jury's trying to figure out whether to give them the death penalty. They're going to get convicted and we know they ultimately do get convicted, but really it's, do they deserve the death penalty? And that's where you get all these people coming forward to talk about, the things that we talked about in the beginning, you know, how bad their childhood was and, and how growing up in that horrible environment basically set these guys up for failure and it caused them to have no empathy and it allowed them to carry out these vicious crimes. There was a psychologist that testified uh, on Reginald's behalf that talked about, again, we, we talked about it up front. The fact that, you know, he was sexually active at six years old and that they had been sexually abused. Just, I mean, all of these things. And again, I, I'm not discounting them. They played a factor. But things like this happen to people all the time. It doesn't cause them to go out and murder five people. Well, I mean, there's no excuse for what they did. I guess that's what I'm getting at, right? I, you're, you're always going to have somebody that comes in because you have to mount a defense. We know that. Yeah. So they're going to come in and they're say, these people had, these boys had no chance. Yeah. Terrible childhood. You should, look, they, you should give them a break. They were destined to, to for failure, but I don't believe that. Yeah. Cause they eventually become a grown adults. And adults make decisions. Yes. And you make the decisions, either the right one or the wrong one. But you have that opportunity to make that decision. And and I guess my, my biggest point is there are so many people in this world that grow up with crappy parents, with bad childhoods, sure. sexually abused, and they go on to have... Hey. A great life. Some of the most successful people in this world have come from terrible, terrible childhoods. Up- upbringings. I, I agree. I mean, That's what drove them to the top of their field. Yeah. These people, Reginald and Jonathan, they chose to do what they did. Now, they weren't helped by the way that they were brought up, but they could have chosen a different path. Yeah. And I And I strongly believe that. So in the end, the jury comes back. And they have to say 93 different times guilty. So they find him guilty on 93 charges. Reginald's convicted on 50 of the counts that were up against him. Jonathan is convicted of 43 different counts uh, against him. 
and they're both sentenced to death. It was said that neither of the Carr brothers showed an ounce of emotion when their sentence was read. It's a shocker. So the judge also gave them a sentence of 20 years to life for the death of Ann Walenta. So they didn't get death for that. They got, they got 20 to life. Reginald was sentenced to an additional 47 years in prison on some other crimes. And Jonathan was sentenced to 40 years additional on a couple of other convictions. So something though, very powerful, you know, they always have these victim impact statements. And so Holly is able to give hers and I'm sure it was extremely powerful in the courtroom. And basically, you know, what she said was the sentence imposed on the two brothers will be a much kinder sentence than the one that they imposed on me, my friends and family. And I'm sure she probably said a lot more than that, but that was the, the probably the real grabber part of it. Now, Mark Beffert, brother of Jason, he was in the courtroom when the jury delivered its verdict. He kind of said something to Reginald Carr and I believe it was like happy birthday, mother effer or something like that. Right. Good for him. (laughs) In 2004, the Kansas Supreme court overturned Kansas's death penalty law. So obviously Gibbs, when that happened, that turned everybody's, death sentence into a life sentence, I assume with no parole. Right. But the state attorney general wasn't having it. And he appealed all the way up to the, the Supreme court and the Supreme court did not agree with the Kansas Supreme court. They basically upheld the state's death penalty law, which flipped the car's, and other condemned killers again back to death row. But it doesn't end there, right? So that's 2004. Jump all the way ahead to 2014. The Kansas Supreme Court overturned the Carr's death sentences on appeal. Now, this had nothing to do with the death penalty across the board. No. It was specific to that case. This case. And they overturned it because they said that it was unfair to the brothers to have been tried together. Well, we knew that might come back to bite us. Right. That, and that was an issue up front. The court ruled that the brothers should have been entitled to separate trials. But again, Gibbs, the attorney general wasn't having it. So just like in, in the 2004 death penalty across the board case fight, he appealed this all the way up to the U S Supreme court and they didn't have to, but they agreed to hear this very specific case in March of 2015. But the United States Supreme court does hear the arguments And you can actually go out there and listen to a lot of the arguments. They're out there. But in the end, the Supreme Court reversed the Kansas Supreme Court again. So the one thing about this is, uh, you know, Justice Scalia was involved in this. And he just, you know, he passed away fairly recently. In his writing, Scalia called these murders, quote, acts of almost inconceivable cruelty and depravity. So even Justice Alito, you know, he comes out basically backing up Scalia, right? And he says that almost every death penalty in the U.S. comes across their desk. Death penalty case. Cases. Yes. Yeah. So so they review those. And he says these Kansas murders have to rank among some of the worst he's ever seen. Yeah. And that, I mean, it's got to tell you something, right? But in the end, you know, the Supreme Court basically rules against the Kansas Supreme Court on both issues. Scalia comes out and says that they're wrong on both counts, that they didn't have to be tried separately. 
and that the jurors would not have misunderstood the instructions in the case. And so the Carr brothers are back to life on death row. Yeah, where they should be. It's exactly where they should be. So Gibbs, let's try to end this on a happy note because there's really not much happy in this whole story. Mm -hmm. But something does come out of it. Yeah. And it actually involves Holly, the only survivor of the massacre. And it involves Andrew Schreiber, who... Carjack victim. ...was the the first victim in the, in the spree. And what happens is, is they, they're at the trial. They become friendly at the trial. And afterwards, they start dating. And they ultimately end up getting married in 2004. So I just, I just think that's amazing, you know, and, and maybe part of that is, you know, two people brought together by tragedy and maybe they, they, there was some bond there. Well, and I also, I mean, I think good because I think he'll understand what she went through. Some, not not completely. Yeah. Right. But, But he, but he lived some of that rage that they had. So I think, you know, he, he can, he'll have the better under better chance of understanding what she went through versus somebody's you know, just off the street, didn't know anything about it and trying to put their lives together and knowing that she's going to have this in her mind, right? Mentally, it's going to be something that she'll have to deal with every day. Oh, there's no doubt. And, and, you know, nobody could ever understand probably exactly what she went through because there's very few people Mm. that have gone through to the extent of, you know, the exact extent of what she went through. And again, I mean, I think the world of her, I, I can't say enough. Oh yeah, definitely. What an amazing person that she has to be the willpower, the grit, all the things we talked about before. But I did want to talk about that because we talk so much doom and gloom. And then all of a sudden you kind of have this ray of sunshine at the end yeah. to, to maybe kind of lighten it up a little right. bit. I always like a, some type of happy ending. Yeah, and we don't we don't get too many. Mm-mm. But in this one, we actually had something good come out of it. All right, so that is the case of the Wichita Massacre. So for Mike... And Gibby. Stay safe and keep your own time ticking. <laughs>